in reflecting back on my high school experience, I only have one regret. Just one. And I'm being somewhat facetious here in saying that I only have one regret because I'm sure if I sat down to actually think about it, I could conjure up in my memory bank many other regrets that I had as well. But the reason that I say that I only had one regret is because this regret that I had, if I would have taken care of it while I was in high school, I know it would have solved, perhaps, all the other regrets that I had when I was in high school. And the one regret that I have when thinking back on my high school experience is that I was not a Christian sooner. It was April of 2014 when I became a Christian. And if you're doing the math in your head, that's the year that I graduated. Brock, you're graduating in a couple months, right? It's April of 2014. I'd be Brock's age when I became a true follower of Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me mistaken. I still came to FCA in the mornings faithfully. I still went to FCA camp faithfully. I attended a church now and again when I felt like going. And anyone who would have known me in high school at that time would have said that Marcus Smith is a good guy. He loves his neighbor well. He goes to FCA. He's one of those Christian people. You can turn to him for help, for encouragement, and whatever. But I knew in my heart of hearts that I truly was not following Jesus Christ in my heart of hearts. And it was April of my senior year when I came across a passage in the Bible that changed my life forever. And I truly believe that the Lord converted me through this text of Scripture. And I was talking with a buddy the other day, and we were talking about this same passage from Matthew chapter 7. And he turned to me and he said, that passage is the scariest passage in all the Bible. And I agree with him. There's a sense in which this passage scared me into the kingdom of heaven. It put the holy, righteous fear of God into my soul and convicted me that I was not truly following the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that even in a room of this size today, that there is a Marcus Smith out there. Somebody who professes to be following Christ, but in their heart of hearts, might not be. So without further ado, I'd like to read that passage from Matthew chapter 7. This is Jesus' most famous sermon, called the Sermon on the Mount. And in chapter 7, at the end of this sermon, he closes with one of the scariest exhortations that he could have given. It seems that as the crowds got bigger in following Jesus... Jesus' statements only seemed to get harder and more difficult. He seemed to love making distinctions between the wheat and the chaff. And these hard sayings really had the cream rise to the top, if you will. So in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus gives this hard statement to the crowds listening in on this sermon. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you practicers of lawlessness. Terrifying passage here. It's like, Jesus, if you want followers, don't you want to soften up your message just a little bit? But no, he tightens down the screws on what it actually means to follow Jesus Christ. There are three things that I want us to notice about this passage this morning in relation to to what Jesus says about the kingdom of heaven here. We all want to go to heaven, right? 
We all want to spend eternity in Jesus Christ's blessed presence, right? That's why we're here. Fellowship of Christian athletes. We want to be with Jesus. That's what heaven is. It's not just a place. It's ultimately a person. You want to spend forever with Jesus. That's why you want to go there. And people who just want to go to heaven so that they can get out of hell for free and they don't want to actually be there with Jesus, those people will not be in heaven with Jesus. They simply just want to get out of burning forever and suffering forever. But if you are a genuine Christian, you want to be in heaven because you want to be with Jesus. And that's what he is addressing here. Now, the three things that I want us to notice about this passage, they all start with the letter E. They all start with the letter E. The first is the entrance into the kingdom of heaven. The entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Second, the evidence that these people are giving that they should be in the kingdom of heaven. You got the entrance, you got evidence, and then you've got exclusion. The exclusion that these people experience when trying to get into the kingdom of heaven at the end of this passage. Entrance, evidence, exclusion. The entrance. In verse 21, Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Only that person will truly enter into paradise with me. What Jesus is describing here is the great white throne of judgment when everybody will stand in front of Jesus and give an account for their life. After you die, or Jesus comes back to earth, you immediately give an account for what you did while living here in the body. And Jesus says here that on that day, not everyone who thinks that they are genuine followers of Jesus Christ will actually enter into the kingdom, but yet they will still protest against Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, let me in. They're saying, Master, Master, my shepherd, my shepherd. They're saying Jesus' titles back to him. Lord, don't, don't I know you? Aren't, aren't I your friend here, Jesus? They're, they're clinging to his proverbial cloak, if you will. And they're trying to plead their case before him. And Jesus says, this is what the majority of people will be like on that day. They will claim to know Jesus. But Jesus says, not everyone actually knows me. Lord, Lord, they're pleading with him. But not everyone who simply knows my name and knows my divine title is actually my true follower. That's the entrance. He says, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must do my will. We'll talk about what that actually is at the very end here in one verse. That's the entrance. Second, the evidence. The evidence. These people, even though they know in their heart of hearts that they are not genuine followers of Jesus Christ, they still try to give evidence to Jesus, as if he doesn't already know everything that we've ever done, right? They try to pre present evidence before him to say, no, look, I actually am your follower, Jesus. If I'm going to get into heaven based on my works and my good deeds here, Jesus, well, here they are. And look at some of the things that they tell Jesus. It says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Again, they say it, Lord, Lord. They're pleading with Jesus. They think that just by saying his name magically, that gets them in. They think that just by going to FCA or going to church, that gets them in. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? These people have a sterling resume for Jesus Christ. They've done some pretty cool things, allegedly, in Jesus' name. I don't know about you guys, but I've never performed any miracles. Unless you call the 2011 Menominee Indians sophomore football team undefeated season a miracle. I've never performed any miracles. I've never cast out any demons. I'm not an exorcist. 
prophesying in Jesus' name, honestly, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Jesus says it doesn't even matter if you're a pastor. That doesn't mean that you're automatically in the kingdom. I knew a pastor one time who got saved while he was preaching his own sermon. This dude had been a pastor for 20 plus years. (laughs) And he had an aha moment while he was preaching his own sermon that he actually wasn't following the Jesus Christ whom he was preaching about week in and week out. Many pastors even will come before Jesus and say, didn't I know you? We see that the evidence itself that these people provide is not enough to show forth that you actually do know Jesus Christ. A hard saying here from Jesus. And then you see the final verdict here in the final E with the exclusion of these people from the kingdom of heaven. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, you practicers of lawlessness. The most important thing about your life right here and right now is not that you know Jesus Christ. It's that Jesus Christ knows you. He says to these people, Away from me, you practicers of lawlessness. Why? Because I never knew you. I never had a saving relationship with you. You never wanted me in your life, and therefore I do not have a relationship, a meaningful relationship with you. Away from me, you practicers of lawlessness. Now this club is called FCA, right? Fellowship of Christian, what's what's the A? The athletes. You don't have to be an athlete to attend here. I actually encourage you to invite your non-athlete friends. I think FCA is just a great excuse to get Jesus' name into the schools. But you guys probably go to practice. If you're a basketball player, you shoot free throws over and over and over again. If you're a football player, you catch passes over and over again. If you're a track athlete, you get into the blocks and work on your sprint technique over and over and over and over and over again until you perfect it. Right? That's what we do as athletes or students. You study, you practice, you hone your craft. It takes time, it takes discipline, it takes diligence. What Jesus is saying here is that these people who professed to follow Jesus Christ were actually practicers of the lawlessness. They were practicers of evil doing. They are practicers of rebellion. In other words, dear friends, they lived a lifestyle that was in total contradiction to the faith that they actually professed. And that was me in high school. A practicer of lawlessness. So Jesus just makes a very grim statement in a couple verses here, right? But I want to look at one last thing in this passage. Jesus says to these people who profess to be followers of Christ that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter the kingdom of heaven. So in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, it says you have to do God's will. So what is God's will? Because I want to enter heaven. I want to spend eternity with Jesus forever. And Jesus just gave us the key to doing that. Namely, doing his will. So what is the will of Jesus? What must I do in order to spend forever with him? Well, I'm so glad you asked that this morning. Because Jesus gives an answer. In a a different passage of scripture. In John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. When the religious elite, the Pharisees, and the Jews of Jesus' day ask him that very question. John chapter 6, verse 28 says this. Then these people asked him, Jesus, what must we do to do the works that God requires? What must we do, Jesus, in order to be in right standing with God? What must we do in order to enter 
heaven, in other words? It's a great question. And Jesus responds this way in verse 29. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. To believe in the one he has sent. In other words, dear friends, believe in Jesus. Believe truly in Jesus. Have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just a head knowledge, informational relationship with Jesus Christ, but you have an intimate heart relationship with Jesus Christ. Believe in the one whom God the Father has sent to earth to die for sinners. And that person is Jesus Christ. The only thing that you have to do in order to truly enter the kingdom of God is to have a true saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Believe and receive Jesus. And that's it. And I truly believe that you know in your heart of hearts if you are following Jesus Christ or not. And many of the people who Jesus is talking to in the Sermon on the Mount and in John chapter 6, they were not genuine followers of him. But the ones who were, those were the ones who genuinely believed and genuinely followed Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word, even when it's difficult. Jesus, you want wholehearted followers after your own name. And God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room this morning who is not genuinely following after you, that they would repent and that they would believe truly in you and receive you truly. And not just try to go out and do good works like these false believers were doing in Matthew 7. But I pray that they would truly cling to you and not cling to themselves and believe in themselves, but rather that they would believe in you and in you alone for their salvation. But God, I also pray for those who are genuine believers in here today, that they would live wholeheartedly for you and be a light for you in a dark place, even as like Menominee High School. Give them the courage and the strength to stand up for their faith, even as this semester comes to a close. I praise you for everyone in this room today. May you bless them as they come in and as they go out. And may you work mightily in Menominee High School through them even today. It's in your precious and matchless name that we pray, Jesus. Amen.